uh, yeah, so my name is Miguel Hernandez. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, comics and graphic design. Um, as Spike said, I, um, I met Henry, uh, I'm trying to remember how many years ago that was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it was a couple of years ago, and um, we met by, uh, I needed some copies done of some comics, and um, we just got started talking about, uh, you know, the design work and uh, the, the overall uh, look of the books and the illustration, and uh, Henry gave me a lot of insight on paper, and and from there, it, it kind of sparked on from one thing to the next. And uh, I've been really getting more into comics and graphic design a lot more ever since. Um, so just introduction. Um, so I have a, a company uh, called Studio JS. Uh, right now, we mainly focus on um, comics and graphic design. We do do a lot of illustration. Uh, most of our work does usually uh, consist of graphic design or um, making logos for companies. Also designing things like um, what, what I've been doing a lot lately in the past two years is storyboarding, uh, whether it be for companies that are trying to uh, sell their uh, services to another company or uh, companies that want to, um, uh, I guess, uh, appeal to a certain audience and they kind of want, want like some advice. Um, so I run the company with my sister. Um, she, so we basically are, we have our own projects now. So the project I'm working on now, which is a book called GSA. So it's a graphic novel, uh, manga series. Uh, the character you see right here, um, is Hanzo. That's a comic series we've had for a very long time. I, I kind of started the company with his books and then I'll be working on something later called Nero Zero. Um, so here's a quick look at, uh, I just, this is just a snapshot of my website. Uh, this is just some of the work that I've done for just illustration work. Um, and this is also, I have a, uh, one of my, so this was a comic I did for the scene magazine, uh, for their annual comics issue about two years ago. And, uh, it just kind of highlights what my life is like as a comic book artist. And since I have a family with children, uh, most of my work is done at night. So the, basically the joke, well, the, the, we met at uh, the art museum and we discussed what we were going to do for our comics. So the plan was, was that our comics were run into each other as one single story. So mine just talked about, you know, just being a comic artist and kind of making a little jab at people that uh, make comics like, uh, how are you going to survive and that kind of thing. And it's a bad career. You're not going to make any money. So the comic was basically a little jab about that. Um, so next, um, here's my sister's work. My sister, uh, she dabs in more than just the graphic design. My sister does a lot of, um, she does, uh, like she makes her own uh, clay figurines. And uh, we bring these to, we bring these to shows. And sometimes I, we kind of get, uh, we kind of rage war with each other when we uh, have conventions because some conventions uh, she'll sell like crazy, like she'll sell the little uh, clay figurines and the little cute pictures and like the characters and I may sell a comic or two and then we'll have a different con uh, convention where I'll sell a lot of comics and she might sell like one or two things. So it's kind of funny, but um, she uh, always, uh, always made this kind of stuff and uh, it, it helps because my sister, she helps me think a little bit differently sometimes um, when it comes to, you know, what books we're working on, what projects we're working on. Um, so it's definitely good to, to have her with me on uh, my next slide. So um, just a little bit about making comics. Um, I'm not trying to bore you all, but just to kind of give you a look into what we do. So this, what you're looking at now is after I come up with an idea, um, as far as my process, this would be the thumbnails. So when we're designing a comic, um, I try to look at the overall project. Um, I try to design every single page. And um, I also try to get a lot of the, uh, the, um, the difficult work out of the way. So that means like, you know, space and time and action and, and how panels run with each other. Um, I noticed that a lot of uh, some artists I know are not thumbnailing enough and they're not working on their comics beforehand. So this is something that I take very serious. It takes me actually longer to do this step than any other step in the, in the comic making process. Um, and the next step would be, uh, oh, well, there's my slide. It was wrong. So, uh, yeah, this would be the, the basic comic making process for us. We start with like our ideas. We go to thumbnails from thumbnails. We go to rough pencils 
then to inks, then to tones and color. Um, and then from there we go to dialogue and edit. And then the end would be uh, book design, which is where the graphic design part comes in. But uh, we'll talk about that at the end. So Spike and I got to talking and we talked about uh, what programs I use. And one of the things that I told him was that I do a lot of my work now because I have, a, I got kids running around everywhere on the iPad Pro. Um, a lot of my rough pencils, my thumbnail sketches are done via iPad Pro. Um, I use a program for penciling called Procreate and uh, basically allows me to, I started the program and I can literally just go right in and start my pencil work. Um, the iPad Pro to me was just a no-brainer. I used to be a tech at Apple. And uh, when they came out with this, I saw the Apple Pencil and I was done. I was like, oh, I got to have this. And I got it. I did not use it at first. I kind of just used it for like Netflix and watching videos. And then one day I finally was like, you know, let me give it a try. I highly recommend it to anyone who is trying to, um, you know, work uh, if, they, if you're on the go a lot or if you, you know, you're not always in your office space or in your studio space, I recommend it because it's light. The programs on it are very, very, very well done compared to when it first started. I mean, um, we were just talking about the Adobe suite, but I keep hearing things about Affinity. So I might even actually try giving Affinity a shot now because uh, a lot of the stuff we design is either with Illustrator or InDesign or Photoshop, but I'm hearing Affinity. <laughs> Henry giving a thumbs up. I'm mean, hearing Affinity is a, a little bit better. And, and honestly, I don't mind the price of Affinity. So, you know, paying one time. Uh, also, I use another program called uh, Procreate and Clip Studio. And Clip Studio is a program from Japan. And uh, it was uh, used for Japanese artists in Japan. They brought it to America. And um, now a lot of American comic artists are using it. And it's a phenomenal program. Let so, me before you move on to go, let me like um let me instigate. That might be the polite word for it. <laughs> sure. So tell me what tell me what you think of your um how of your Cintiq drawing tablet because I know there's a couple of people here that have one. So I wanted to instigate some like uh, conversations or yeah. arguments maybe. Uh, I, I don't too much have a problem with the Cintiq. I do have one. I bought the 13-inch HD uh, about a year or two when it first came out. Um, I used it for a long time. It was it was my workhorse for about eight to eight, maybe eight years. Um, but I always would get annoyed with the, uh, the latency was always a little off. And um, no offense to anybody who's a non-traditional artist, but if you're traditionally trained like I am, you kind of, you just know that that latency is there. You feel it. And there definitely was a latency. And I also would have trouble with sometimes because um, I like to be very precise with my line work. And I would notice that like, it might be like a millimeter off from where I was, from the line that was being created, from where my pen was being placed on the Cintiq. And, um, when I worked at Apple and they brought out the iPad Pro and we tried uh, the Apple Pencil, no latency. Uh, where I put down the Apple Pencil, it made a mark. And after that point, I was, I was, I was sold. Um, sad thing is, is that my Cintiq has been sitting in the drawer now for about five years going on. Like, so I haven't, um, I haven't used it that much since. So I might actually want to look to donate that at some point or unless my iPad dies. But um, I, I think Cintiq is great. I do think they kind of have some catching up to do now. Um, and then I know that they're Windows based, which is, you know, that's, that's all good. It's no big deal with that. But um, I don't think they can't, that latency is just, it's not there yet for some reason. I haven't tried the new ones yet, so I can't say anything about that. Um, I know they just released a new one, but from what I, I just think, wanted yeah. to instigate a little bit. So yeah. sorry, sorry to digress you from your. <laughs> no, no, you're no. You, it's a phenomenal point because it does come up sometimes. Um, you can get a lot done on the iPad Pro. I will say that, um, and I'm going to keep talking about the iPad Pro because the uh, the things were. Well, I'll be showing you. For example, like I said, this is done in iPad. This is done on the iPad Pro on the program Procreate. I think I also brought up another slide, but basically this would be like a rough draft of a, uh, these are my rough pencils. Um, what I usually do is I make my rough pencils in Procreate. 
I then take a, I, I have a uh, Epson Workforce 1750 and it prints up to 13 by 19. And I take uh, 11 by 17 Bristol board paper. Oh, there's a line. I didn't do that, did I? Who's doing that? <laughs> there's a van, there's a, that's Henry being a vandal, I think. <laughs> I'm like, there's a line. But uh, I take it and I print it on 11 by 17 paper. And um, I then go over that with ink. I don't do, I don't usually do any more pencils from there. So this is actually a screenshot of Procreate. And this is why I like Procreate because it's a very simple interface. If anybody's ever wanted to use it, uh, give it a shot. The app itself is only like eight bucks. Um, but as you can see, the interface is very simple. You have the two tabs on the, the one side here. One is for Zoom. The other one, I mean, uh, one is for the brush uh, size. Uh, look at me, I'm forgetting what the other one's. Oh, one's for opacity and the other one's for brush size. And then up at the top, you have the your brush, whatever you pick, your smudge tool, your eraser, and your layers. Um, and then you can, you know, you also have new settings uh, that they've added throughout the years. And that'll be next to gallery where you see the wrench and the, the magic wand tool. Um, so here is a drawing. One thing that I like about Procreate is it does what's called a time lapse. So you can actually record, it records your drawing for you. So um, if anybody, we're, we're in the age of sharing a lot now with social media. So now a lot of artists are taking their drawings and they're doing time lapses of them with Procreate. And then Procreate, knowing that people use Instagram, they've made it so you get, uh, I think, 30 second to one minute clips of your drawings. And that can be put online. So people can, you know, go back and watch it. The good thing is that the files themselves are not large. They're like maybe a, a couple megabytes. So it's not going to take up a huge amount of space um, uh, if you try to export it. So that's why I recommend people try Procreate. Um, it saves your, your process. How, so how long are, did it take you to draw that one, that one image you just had there? Like, what was um, this one took me about to do the full painting digitally. It took me about maybe an hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half. I work pretty fast. Um, <laughs> I'm also, uh, when I was a painting uh, traditionally, I was a messy painter. So <laughs> it would take me a lot longer, which is why I like Procreate because the, uh, the brushes that they have behave a lot like traditional mediums. So if you have traditional training, you will kind of know how to, play around with the settings a bit and kind of get the look and feel of a real painting that you want. Yeah, there was not everybody here was at the last month's meeting, but the last meeting we did was on the iPad and art on the iPad. So a bunch of us. So Procreate was a good part of that program. Yeah, it's it's a phenomenal app. And it's all it, they're a very small team. So the cool thing is that if you have an issue or problem, they usually listen to what you have to say if you if you have a message or I mean not a message, if you have an issue you can uh, email the support team or like the people that use the app will do it. Um, so here are the actual inks. This is just um, what I scan the inks from my actual uh, from when I work on them with ink. Um, and then on the right, you, I mean, next to it, you'll see when I add tones and the tones are added with uh, Clip Studio, which is the program that I use on the iPad Pro also. And it's also a desktop uh, program. Um, so I, I literally just scan them at 600 DPI and then I put them into the, I, uh, import the images into the program. And, um, at that point I add the tones or color. It depends on what kind of, uh, illustration I'm working on. And then this is a, basically a, a screenshot of what Clip Studio looks like on the iPad. Um, the cool thing about Clip Studio, <coughs> Adobe, <coughs> is they were able to take <laughs> the whole app that's the desktop version of the app and put it on the iPad itself. So there, you don't have any difference in the app that you use on your computer or your PC um, than what you would be using on the iPad. It's a hundred percent identical. It's the, it's a hundred percent the same. There's literally no difference. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like kind of rare. I think. Yeah. It's, there's no difference. I, I, when they did it, it was, uh, it was kind of like at first I didn't believe it was true, but I got it. Only downside to it is that it is subscription based. I wish it, I wish it wasn't because um, I already paid for the desktop version. So it's like $8 a month. 
the other cool thing is about it is that it integrates, they have their own cloud system. It's, it works really great. So if I'm working on a, a comic, um, I save it to the cloud or I'm working on a cloud. And then when I get home, I can literally upload it from the cloud and finish what I'm doing on my computer. So I definitely recommend this. Also the inking, the inking tools on this app are phenomenal. Do you like start the stuff on your iPad and finish it on your Mac? Or do you like start it on your Mac and finish it on your iPad? Is there like a Sometimes, like a mainly just, I mainly do most of my work traditionally first and then scan it. Um, the only time I'll come back with Clip Studios to add, um, to add like, you know, some additional inking lines. I know my sister is pretty much all digital. So my sister Michelle will pretty much do all her inking and penciling and everything in the uh, app itself. She doesn't usually go back and forth. She usually stays all on the iPad. Um, and she's been using Procreate. So she's been making, she's making a full book now on Procreate and it looks phenomenal. You don't um, have fights about who's doing it better? No, no, we don't fight about that. <laughs> we right. never fight about that. No, we fight about other stuff like, uh, you know, did you put the file in the drive or, or you forgot to proofread this and that kind of stuff. Um, so now we're on Adobe. Uh, so when it comes to uh, graphic design, I, you, I get to use a little bit of my graphic design uh, skills um, when it comes to adding the dialogue for comics. Um, so this is where I downloaded a uh, template from a, a letter, a comic letter that's uh, digital named uh, uh, Nate Picos. He has, I think it's Picos or Picos, but he has a site called Blambot. And that's where you can buy a lot of the comic uh, book typefaces. So if you want that comic book typeface look, um, that's, that's purely what he designs. He also makes templates. But this is where I basically create, um, I create my, uh, you know, caption boxes. I create my little style guide. And then from there, I make my balloons using Adobe Illustrator. And then uh, at that point, it's just a lot of kerning and, you know, trying to make the type fit in the bulk, the balloons right. Um, this is the only part of making comics I hate. <laughs> I wish, now, if I could pay somebody to do this, I would. Um, just because I just don't like to deal with type all the time. But this kind of type, when it's a lot, I can deal with the design. But this kind of stuff just drives me crazy sometimes. Um, and then this is basically what the comics look like after we add everything so at this point my sister has gone through she's made sure i've got i've got all my my spellings and everything correct and uh at this point this is when the page is final and we can start to put them into the uh the book or start to put it into like a, a book form um so what about graphic design so um when it comes to like your comic page let out your lettering your comic logos your book design marketing i try to tell a lot of the comic artists that i meet um you probably should brush up on some type and graphic design skills because if you don't have the time or money and resources to hire somebody, you can learn the principles yourselves and then you can do a lot of it yourself like we do at Studio JS. Um, so this is just to turn things over in a different direction for a second. This is the graphic design aspect of the work that I do. And I've just started recently doing this kind of work in the past two or three years, but companies have just come to me and asked me, you know, can you design a logo? At that point, um, they give me some ideas. A lot of times companies don't have anything. They just have the name and what they represent. And I kind of have to go from there. So a lot of these logos that I've done in the past couple of years is mainly just me going off of just their name of the company and what they do. Uh, are, the rest, any, are they asking you to do illustration projects too? Uh, only a couple. Uh, the one very good films, he actually asked me to do the animation to his company um, that starts before his film. So he did a uh, independent comedy film called Hey Mr. Postman. And he wanted the chair and his uh, logo to collapse while his kids are making fun of it and laughing. So <laughs> I actually, here we go again, I did it in Photoshop and it, I, the timing was messed up. So I actually ended up animating it in Procreate and then exported it into Photoshop to kind of fine tune, fine tune the animation process of the chair collapsing. Um, but no, most of them, they, it's just logo design. A lot of times I'll design the logo and then maybe a month or two later, a company is recommended to me from somebody else. So 
that's kind of just basically how we've been surviving off of uh, graphic design. Um, what's next? So cover design um, is something we I take very seriously, and my, me and my sister, we talk about it a lot, but one of the things that I've noticed with cover design, I go to a lot of conventions and I see a lot of other independent illustrators, and sometimes I just want to talk to them about their covers because I've seen sometimes where I can't even understand what the cover says because um, they're not legible. Um, and sometimes I tell people, you know, you want to, you want to sell it with your cover. So we're going to, uh, one of the people that I highly recommend to anybody who wants to be an illustrator, comic artist is Jake Parker. Um, he's the guy that started Inktober. Um, but basically when it comes to someone who's an illustrator and graphic designer, he's definitely a good example of somebody you could learn a lot from. He's got a phenomenal YouTube channel. He talks from about everything from making comics to starting your, starting a Kickstarter breaks down how he did his Kickstarter. Um, basically just a, a real, 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 uh, real well-rounded, um, artist and illustrator. Is, and, uh, is Kickstarter used a lot for like, you know, getting like a book made? Oh yeah. He was one of the first people that I got, uh, that I learned from when it came to Kickstarter because I didn't know what Kickstarter was, but he would just put down that he wanted to raise like 7,000 and he ends up raising like 120 something thousand. And he's got all these books that he's made via Kickstarter. Uh, I really would like to say that he's one of the people that kind of made it famous for artists. Um, definitely opened a lot of doors for people um, that wanted to, uh, you know, get a book printed and, and get it printed by the fans and not necessarily by like a publisher. Um, so, and then following suit to him is another group of guys. There's two guys called Creature Box. And um, I just always love their graphic design and their, their aesthetic because their stuff just looked, it looked, it had texture to it. You know, it, they, they made stuff look like it was ripped and had tape on it. And I always thought that was very creative when it came to um, designing something for, you know, something that even kids would want to look at. Because a kid would find a cover like this interesting. Um, and I think sometimes just there's a lot of focus on adults, but they, they kind of opened my mind as far as, you know, the, the aesthetics of, of, of catching somebody's eye. Um, and then here's my first shot at doing a cover. This was a long time ago. Um, I would definitely like now that I look at this cover, it drives me crazy. But, you know, this was uh, the first um, comic that I had came out with about 10 years ago. And uh definitely would make a lot of changes but at that time I was pretty happy um so for my designs for books I started I taught myself how to use Adobe InDesign and that was not fun but I did it because uh InDesign is not <laughs> InDesign is not as cool looking uh if you ever opened up InDesign it does not look as cool as Photoshop or Illustrator it's like you open and you're like what is going on it's a lot of uh, uh a lot of type um, a lot of things for type typography, which I'll talk about a little later, but I had no idea. Um, this was a couple years later. I was trying to go with the same, you know, design aesthetic. So this is for a, a different book, but um, I kind of felt a little bit different about book design, but I still wanted to keep those same design principles from the previous book. And then uh, this was maybe two years ago. Um, this was a book that I did. Uh, the cover was in color and, uh, this was a, the character that we have. So this, the, the cover you're looking at right now, this was drawn and painted digitally in clip studio. This was until, uh, I started using procreate more for painting, but, um, all of the type work is all done in Adobe InDesign. And I think I even got one, a document that I could pull up. So this is my latest comic, uh, G say, and uh, pretty much uh, the uh, cover is done. I inked it uh, traditionally. I colored it in Photoshop. And this was the first cover is on the left. It's the one that has the, the brushed in logo. And uh, a lot of people couldn't read what it was saying. So I ended up changing it to the other side where I, I wanted to make the, the name more legible. Does that mean um, anything in Japanese? So Jisei means death poem. So basically, in a, a, a lot of times for like people who were of importance, um, they will write a death poem before they passed away. Like if they were just dying of an old age or they wanted to 
it, it was kind of like a way to, um, I, I don't know how to, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it, but it was kind of like a way to um, bring their thoughts in together before they passed. And, you know, they would write it down. And of course, somebody would be there so they can, you know, transcribe it. But um, a lot of it was usually poetry. Um, so if you ever read the book, G say, you'll understand why it's called uh, G say or death poem. But basically it's about this character, Kana, who is sentenced uh, to a death, certain death penalty for a crime that he didn't commit. So the story kind of just follows that. And it's basically his death poem because the place that he sent is basically for him to die. Um, this is the most recent cover that I did uh, for G-Say um, when I put it on uh, Comixology. So this is the cover that I'm using now. This painting was done all in uh, Procreate. So how did you, like, why did you get into um, anime? Oh, anime. So we talked about this. Um, so for me, anime, I got back and I was into anime because of my older brother. Um, my sister and I would, uh, you know, we love watching cartoons because we grew up in the, we grew up in the eighties and nineties and, uh, my brother came. All dubbed in Japanese, so we never knew what anything anybody was saying. But can you, can you repeat that last sentence? I your your microphone was accidentally oh. muted when I muted someone who just came into the room. So oh, okay, sorry to interrupt. No, you. you're good. Um, basically, uh, we uh, he would bring on VHS tapes with um, random animes, and uh, would have things like Akira on there, like Fist of the North Star, um, Vampire Hunter D. And uh, we saw these films and we were just done. At that point, we never looked at animation the same. Like we would look at Disney and be like, ah, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> People were like, ah, oh, Japanese, you know, they, they take it to another level. This is nothing, this is little baby stuff. Uh, but, uh, not, but nothing against American animation, but we really got, especially me, I got really fond of the, the aspect to aspect storytelling, which is basically when you go from like uh, instead of going from action to action or line to line, you go from um, kind of like a, a scene to a different scene. So if you're, if you're, you know, if you're getting ready to show a mom who's a stay at home mom, you'll show her house first in the first camera. And then the next camera might pan to her car. And then the next camera would be her in the kitchen. And then the next camera would be like the kids coming down the steps and I, I was really fond of that way of storytelling. And you see a lot of that in uh, Hayao Miyazaki films. And um, you see a lot of that in uh, a director that I like, uh, is Mamoru, Mamoru Oshii, who does uh, Ghost in the Shell and a film called, um, uh, you know all these. Uh, some people call it Wolf's Frame, but the Japanese call it Jinro. Um, but it's a, those are phenomenal films that do a lot of aspect to aspect um, storytelling. Um, trying to think of what else. I don't know if we did. Anybody have any questions? Because I'm I'm kind of like speeding through this. <laughs> um, let me see. So, so, like, are there any American films that do aspect to aspect? Like, that's something I didn't know about. Like, it was in your dis meeting description, but I didn't know mm -hmm. what the. I just like left it there because I didn't know what I didn't know if it was a typo or what that was exactly. No, um, one that I can think of recently, not too recently, that I saw some usage of it is Christopher Nolan. He, he tends to do it sometimes, um, mainly uh, the scene in the beginning of The Dark Knight with, with uh, Heath Ledger, the whole scene of the, the school buses and him robbing the bank. A lot of that was, uh, it wasn't necessarily just action to action. They kind of built the whole film and you kind of got in the environment of the film first and then they started to show you who everyone was and how the movies played out. You don't see it too much though that I've seen in American films, but I have to be honest with you, I don't watch too many, uh, I haven't watched too many. Uh, I've been really into like watching uh, old school samurai films from like the 1950s, like Akira Kurosawa films, um, just so I can tell some stories a little bit different. Um, so I'm, I, fortunately, I don't know too many. Uh, <laughs> are, those on, are those on Netflix or where would you watch those if someone wanted to watch them? 
So Akira Kurosawa, um, the Criterion Collection is a good place to start. Um, Criterion that now they have an app, so you can pay the subscription like everybody has now, um, and then you can watch his whole, mostly his whole catalog. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another. There's another samurai film called Zatoichi that I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, I can't, I'm trying to think of uh, any other ones. Um, um, I'm really fond of the It Man series with Donnie Yen. I think that's a phenomenal film series. <laughs> um, I know there's dark. a couple. Like I think Chris Suster likes like like the um, anime, and you know Jerry Shamry has a million films. Like so, he's probably they're all probably not in their heads at those. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, I'm, I'm big into that kind of stuff. So that that definitely has helped push me on as far as uh, uh, drawing in my 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 artwork. Um, and then a lot of times me and, my, me and my sister will trade films and be like, oh, did you see this? Did you see that? And I'm also big into horror, but not all horror films. I kind of like horror films made in the, the 80s and the 70s, not so much movies in the 2000s and the later eras. Oh, I won't watch those. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hey, right. a, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of a... a can't think of a, a horror movie that I saw recently that I was like, I'm, I'm a little excited about, I'm excited about the candy, man. Uh, I still don't know why people play around and say that, you know, I don't even joke around and say the candy man's name, but I'm very excited to see what Jordan Peele uh, and his, and the, I don't, I think, I don't think he's the director, but I'm excited to see what direction it takes this time uh, with, with a fresh pair of, uh, with a fresh brain and thought process. Um, Here's my sister's comic, The Bitter Beans. So my sister's starting to get a bit into design too. So she likes to make comics uh, that are uh, funny based on like experiences she has. My sister's a coffee drinker. I'm not, I love tea. So my sister goes to uh, the Coco, I forgot what it's called. It's Coco Bakery or that's one of her places to go off of pain, I believe. Uh, it's a Korean. <laughs> I believe they sell a lot of. Uh, I've only went there once, and it was jam packed. But uh, she's made a lot of stories based on just uh, her experiences going to coffee shops and stuff like that. And um, people love her stories. I love her stories because they they make me laugh. My stuff's a little bit more serious, so it's refreshing to always see Michelle's work. Um, it's a little bit lighter. Um, we also do prints every now and then. I don't usually like to do these kind of things, but um, it, it helps when movies come out. I'm a big fan of the Mandalorian series. My kids love that series. Uh, we're also big Zelda fans, and we like Link. Um, um, my kids really love Link. But uh, we also sell prints, and uh, a lot of my ideas for prints, I get, I see what's going on and what's popular, and then I'll draw it. And like I said, uh, I'll try to also put some of my, my graphic design elements in there as far as, you know, using the names and putting my logo in the, on, the, on the bottom of it. Um, my, these are my sisters. Um, we were going to create a, a clothing line, and we were coming up with ideas, and my sister was uh, coming up with a lot of concepts with the uh, the girls wearing hoodies and things like that for winter wear. And a lot of times my sister will send me her uh, graph, her drawings or illustrations and I'll usually add the, the type or the, the graphic design elements to it. Um, a lot of times she just likes to just illustrate them. She, she always says she wants to get into it, but sometimes we're just pressed for time. Um, let me see what else we got here. So in terms of uh, like marketing, um, I've been finding new ways to kind of get my stuff uh, seen a bit differently. So I sell my books digitally. And one of the places that uh, we decided to start uh, selling them is on Gumroad. And uh, Gumroad basically makes it uh, flawless. It's a flawless experience when, you, when you're putting it online because um, once you put it online, you type in your price and all that kind of stuff. And at that point, you can sell it. Another thing about Gumroad is, is that it's a haven for tutorials. So if, if you want to learn something as far as how to draw and procreate or use um, programs like uh, Clip Studio and uh, um, like a lot of the iPad programs or uh, the apps, uh, Gumroad is a good place to start. Um, they have tutorials on everything from, you know, composition to storyboarding to, to graphic. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, There's, are they selling the tutorials then? Like they're a couple bucks or like, or are they free to get people to put them on the website? Yeah. Most of them, believe it or not, aren't that expensive at all. 
the most I've ever spent maybe was $15, but usually they're in the $10, $8 range. Um, but a lot of uh, tutorials I got were from people who were like from uh, Disney, uh, people who had worked at Disney, you know, were storyboard artists or, or people who were designers. And, um, you know, I just wanted to have like a one up on something. So I'll, I'll buy a class from there. And then once I found out that I could sell comics on there, it's been great. Funny thing is, is that I tried to do a Kickstarter uh, last year. Um, we didn't raise enough money. I went through my numbers and I kind of asked for too much. And now that I know that I would do it a bit differently. But uh, once I went on the Kickstarter and said, hey, you know, this didn't work out. If you go to Gun my Gun World store, I've got physical copies of the books just in case you still want like the small mini comics of it that we sold. And I sold out. I was done. I sold out in about a week. Um, and Gumroad was, it was, it was easy. Their address was in there. All I had to do was print off their address and, uh, you know, stick it on the envelope, put the comic in there and we were good to go. Um, what people, kind of percentage of cut do they take of your sales? Oh, it's, it's small. It's, it's something that I, I didn't even notice. I think it's like a, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a lot at all. Oh, um, right. It, it, it is a lot easier for something like, in, instead of trying to do a store using like Shopify, because or or uh, Big Cartel is a good one too. I'm not going to say they they they're not they're uh, the gum rolls the best. Big Cartel is a good one too, especially if you're just starting out. Because um, I've even seen people sell their services um, sometimes on like uh, gum roll. Like you can hire them um, using one of the little uh, the the prompts or links that they have there. Um, so this is just like another version of how we try to market our books. Um, I made this uh, a couple months ago um, because I'm thinking about, I, I was thinking about uh, doing another Kickstarter later in the summer, but that was before the pandemic has uh, surfaced and kind of taken over uh, the world right now. So I don't know if I'm gonna follow through. I might try something different, but this was uh, basically um, a graphic that I had made. I used Adobe InDesign. I used the Photoshop and Adobe InDesign and there's a uh, site that you can go to to get these little uh, mock-ups called uh, CoverVault, um, CoverVault.com. And basically, he makes these little mock-ups of the, the books, and you can put in your designs. And then um, I used InDesign to add the rest of the type um, to the, to the uh, ad. And then uh, here's another example of how we um, try to uh, – I put these on Instagram. So the longer one is what you would use for your story, um, for your Instagram stories, and those are just the little 15 second clips. And then the square ones, of course, are the square Instagram format that you would use. And um, this is where I love, this is where I can use my, my type abilities um, because I'll go in with Adobe InDesign and I'll uh, put in my images and then I'll start adding my type using InDesign. I heard a podcast where they were interviewing a comic book artist and he put some of his comics on um, Instagram and he makes each of the pictures like a panel and then yep. he puts the arrows on there so people know to click on it to go to the next panel for the story. Does that work? Have you done that? It, it does. I've done it a couple of times. Um, I, I like it. The only thing is, is that, you know, you are, you, you kind of have to get creative because it is that perfect square. They did change it uh, recently. I think you can swipe with the landscape format. I'm, I'm not sure. I have to double check on that. But I know for sure, yes, you're right. I've seen a lot of people do it. A lot of people use it for gags, which to me is it's good for using, uh, like if you have a gag comic, um, if the comics I use, they don't work too well with that format because it's that, that you got to fit everything in that square. But um, yes, I do recommend that for people who want to make gags and want to get their, their work known and develop a fan base. That's an excellent way to uh, oh, to okay. Uh, um, you, now, what about your, uh, do you have printed books too? We do. Um, we probably, we're almost running out. Um, I think I still got a couple more of, uh, actually, let me see if I can pull up my uh, gum road here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me see if I can pull up my, uh, our gum road page. Give me a second. had it pulled up but i must have closed out on the accident well gumroad actually they send they send out the printed ones 
No, that's basically all us. So oh, you'll, right. you'll basically just get the uh, the order for it, and then at that point we'll go in and. Um, so this is what it would look like. So this is what your the Gumroad store looks like. Um, all these are pretty much digital, um, except this one right here. So this one I still have, and I still sell. I still have these in print, but I don't sell these. I just pass these out at conventions because these aren't characters I own. These are just little, you know, short story fan comics that I did just for fun. And uh, a lot of times these are just conversation starters and, and also a way for kids because these are kids safe. So kids can come up and just take a comic. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times kids don't have money. So <laughs> they'll just come up and be wanting to talk and you're like, you know, take a comic. And I'll also sell this one for free too. Um, I've been passing that out just because a lot of kids like to read it. Um, but these, I, I haven't printed these yet. Um, I'm kind of holding off. Unfortunately, this, this, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has stopped a lot of my plans for now. So we're going to have to reset a little bit um, as far as what we're uh, going to do with the, the comics. Um, but I'm trying to think if that's where we can. Uh, and I think that was my last slide. Okay. <laughs> So I'm not really sure how to do the question. I, I don't know whether it's going to be chaos or whether it will be okay for que how the, the questions will be working. So I guess, why don't you uh, stop your screen share? Okay. And I guess I'll unmute the mics and, and we'll see. And I guess if I have to do it one by one or manage that, I will, but let's see how we, let's just see how it goes. I've, since I haven't done this before. So does someone have a question that they can maybe text it to text it and we'll let Miguel answer that. Oh, I think we're good. I did phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> oh, all right. Here's one. Do your fan, do you find your fans? Uh, where'd it go? Do you find your fans are more interested in your imagery or your story? Um, both actually. Um, it's funny. You, you don't realize how many people are reading your comic until like people come up to you and you're talking about it and you're like, Oh wow, you read it. Like, yay. Um, but it's actually been, it's been really cool developing, I, I, I try not to use the word fans. Um, I kind of see them as friends because they're, they're a patron and they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're helping you achieve a certain level of success. Um, but, um, it's, it's, re it's really refreshing. And a lot of times, um, they, uh, they, they can be very reassuring. A lot of them are very positive. Um, it's funny now because now when we do shows, it's, uh, we'll go to different places and we'll see people from the same shows and they're like, oh, hey, I remember you guys. And, you know, now we're getting to know people by name now. So that's pretty cool to develop that. But a lot of people just like um, the imagery we have. They, they, they always comment that it's positive, um, especially a lot of the stuff that uh, my sister does too. Um, the, the kids love her stuff because she makes a lot of the cute stuff. Um, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, we are getting questions. So we're getting, yeah, we are getting, so yeah, I, I didn't, I wanted, I, I wanted to not just have like a pause right there at the end. Uh, it says, what percentage of your business is anime versus graphic design? Uh, they're kind of neck and neck now, I will say that. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about storyboarding in the past, I would say in the past six months. Um, a lot of people have been asking about storyboarding if I've been interested in storyboarding. Um, I've even been asked to work on a film, Could, can't talk about it because I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's canceled from the last thing I, I think it's canceled or it's just postponed. But um, yeah, that was the last thing they told me to me, you can't speak about this. I'm like, oh great. So I can't, <laughs> I can't even talk about it. But yeah, uh, it's kind of neck and neck now. Um, I'm hoping at one point it will be a lot more storyboarding and anime based. Um, not that I don't like graphic design, but I love drawing more so. Um, so that's a good question. Um, you, when you do your aspect to aspect, that part of the anime, do you use that in your graphic design too when you're like doing any kind of advertising or marketing? Uh, yes. So when we, when I made like a video for the G State Kickstarter campaign, it was a lot of shots to build up like the scene and the feel of it. Um, we, um, but I mostly use it just in my drawing. Um, I haven't really had an opportunity to do it for graphic design, but that, that's a good question too. Right, so that was my question. So here's Chris Suster's question. Do you, did you grow up watching anime? What comics did you read as a kid? Oh yeah. 
It was uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Yeah, <laughs> and influence Astro Boy others. Uh, yes, I did grow up watching anime. Uh, a lot of it. My brother gave us a lot of anime. A lot of it was not appropriate, but we, we <laughs> a lot of it was not appropriate. But we watched it, and uh, I I looked at it from a different step. I I knew I was seeing something different because my you know my friends would comment if they saw a movie or they were somebody they saw it. I would be like, no, nah, that's not what I paid attention to. But um, yes, um, as far as Miyazaki, oh yes, very definitely an influence. Um, comics I grew up reading as a kid, Spawn, um, Spider-Man, um, I'm trying to think of what else. As a teenager, it was like uh, Battle Chasers, Blade of the Immortals, always been one of my favorite series. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, because a lot of them are on my wall, Akira, and uh, I think a uh, uh, whole bunch of them, mainly Spawn, though. I was a huge Spawn fan. Um, let me see. Can you find it? You don't know how to, oh, people talking about chatting. How much time do you put into completing a book? Oh, so once I get done with thumbnailing and roughing, um, the ink work is the fastest part. Um, it usually takes me, if I'm working on a 28 page comic book, like G say to finish it from start to finish would probably take about three months. Um, it could probably go a lot faster than that, but because of my, my, you know, having family and that kind of thing. Um, and usually I'm working on G say while I'm working on somebody else's project. So G say is usually something I work on at night or, you know, in my free time. But if, uh, without restrictions, it probably take me about, I'm on two months, two months. Uh, I'm trying to think of what other questions. There's a few there. There's uh, let's see. How old were you when you started your interest in Asian culture? Oh, ever since I was a kid. So um, I remember I was always into martial arts. I am a martial artist. So I, I practice martial arts now. Um, uh, when it comes to, um, let me see. Asian culture, yeah, I've been in it since uh, when I was a kid. I remember when my dad brought home the stack of uh, VHS tapes, and I was like, you know, what is this? It was this big box, and I opened up the box, and it was Bruce Lee. And I was like, oh. So we put Bruce Lee on, and after that, I was done. I even I even uh, modeled myself walking like Bruce Lee because I was a skinny kid, so that was my way of letting bullies, you know, like, let, you know, I'll give you that business if you want to fight. So everybody would always tell me, like, you walk like this? So, yeah, no. I've always been in the... Have you been to Japan? Uh, no, I want to go, though. I've always wanted to go, and every time I want to go, there's something that happens. And once again, this was one of those things. This was one of those years where I was ready to go and had the money for the ticket. And, you know, now my cousin, he works for the military. He lives there. And uh, I don't even think I would be allowed to stay with him because of this whole situation. So I'm just going to have to wait. But, yes, I love Asian culture. It's particularly Japanese culture. Um, and very fond of the samurai. Um, let me see. Okay, so here's some questions from Christine. So you storyboard before writing the dialogue, not the other way around? Yeah, yes. That's because you're more visual? Yes, I'm a more visual person. Uh, another person that uh, I thought I was weird until I saw a documentary uh, of one of my kids. Uh, I saw a documentary on uh, Hayao Miyazaki. And uh, he storyboards first. He goes through and he'll sit at his desk and he'll look up in the sky and come up with his whole uh, series. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but I think it's something called A Man With No Name or something like that. But it's a documentary that's on like the Asian International Channel and you can watch it on Hayao Miyazaki and it actually follows him while he's making uh, the animation called Ponyo. Um, so... Yes, I'm definitely a visual person. All right, and there's two. There's a question from Henry and from Victor. So okay. We, let's just do a couple more. Okay. Uh, let's see, Christine. Uh, which one? So, Henry, so Tommy Farley's a big influence on you then. Uh, yeah, Tommy Farley mainly because he, you know, he gave up on the Marvel industry and decided to do his own thing. So a lot of comic book artists were very like, you know, that's that's the route. That's the route you should go. Um now I'm more so influenced by uh, artistry wise, Kim Jung Ji, because he draws without using any penciling. He just draws using a brush pen. They give him a paper, they put it on the wall and he literally will draw a whole scene from that point. Um, another person is Jake Parker. 
there's a uh, there's an artist that I'm uh, uh, that I know of that lives in Florida that I'm friends with named Am Liv. Uh, she uh, she does these wonderful pencil graphite drawings that I don't have the patience or time to do. So I'm always just um, amazed by that. I'm amazed by my sister um, uh, just because of the stuff she can make in clay. And uh, my brother, Bruce, who makes music, my, my good friend, Seneca, who makes music. A lot of them, a lot of people from Cleveland I'm influenced by, believe it or not. Um, and I'll try to go to another question. What's another one? Do you consider placement of text as you're illustrating? Oh, yeah. I didn't consider that at first. That's why I always tell children and people who want to get into comics, think about where you want to put your balloons, your speech balloons in your comics as you're drawing it. Don't put that in at the last minute. Don't try to squeeze in dialogue at the last minute. You're going to have a, that's a serious headache. Yeah, try to always implement that first. Leave those spaces empty for a purpose. That's where you're going to put your dialogue because that's a mistake I've made countless times, uh, especially when I first started. Um, yeah. So I actually have, I don't know if this is, I don't, I guess it's, this actually is a question for somebody that's in the audience or participants is like, I guess for like, you know, Emily's, Emily Unkrich is here and her son worked at Pixar and won some Academy Awards. Oh. So like, so I guess Emily, did he like do, did your son, um, read, read, um, anime comics when he was a kid or do you read those yourself because i saw you nodding when you talked about some of the directors so i'm gonna all unmute you i've read anime comic books yes and did you uh, i do not know whether lee looked at anime comic books the one japanese director that you talked about is one of his favorite people i can't think of his name right now he is not is it Miyazaki? Yeah, I think so. Is that, okay. The premier anime yeah. filmmaker, right? Yeah. Yes, phenomenal. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank so, I you. guess, I guess I'd like to do. I would like to wrap up with a thank you, and then I have a poll. So, like for meeting feedback, so I'm going to do another poll. But let's. I know you can like clap or there's like a thing for a reaction. So let's. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank Miguel for presenting tonight. Thank you very much, Miguel. <laughs> so let's see we there's a we can do the applause but